Hello everyone, Reverend Keith Murray here back with you again on uh, KWCL on YouTube and uh, about to start some new ministries. I want to take a little time this, today to talk to you about some changes we're making. Uh, most of you know we tried to reopen the First United Methodist Church of Oak Grove for a short period of time, but I made the decision based on some data that comes about uh, that probably it was best that we stop having worship together. Uh, I know that there are many opinions. There are lots of data out there, some true, some false, some good, some bad, uh, and I weighed all of that. But I must tell you that I spent a lot of time in prayer and asking God what would be the best thing to do for the congregations I pastor. So uh, I got an answer. I got a pretty distinct answer from God, and I, I polled a few of my church members and asked them to pray, and they began to get some of the same answers. So I felt like God was telling us it was time to revert back to spending most of my time producing videos and uh, sharing with you on KWCL. So that's where we are today as we begin that. We're no longer worshiping at uh, our location at Oak Grove. But we're worshiping, and we're worshiping through the power of technology. And I'm glad you're along. Let me say thank you to all of you who've been listening by the radio or subscribing to my video channel. If you want to subscribe to the video channel, it's Reverend Keith Murray at YouTube. Uh, go there and subscribe. Hit that subscribe button, and you'll be updated every time I put things out. We're going to add some new parts to it. Uh, we're beginning to add. I'm going to add something on Wednesday nights on Facebook. I'm going to Facebook Live. Uh, at around 8 o'clock every Wednesday night, uh, we'll have a time of prayer and a time of short study. Uh, I'm also adding a series. This is the, the beginning. This is sort of the introduction part to my series. I'm doing a series uh, at a request of a lot of you uh, on end times and Revelation. We're going to look at Revelation and Romans and Luke and Matthew and Thessalonians and uh, some passages like that to look at the New Testament take on where we are today in this world, and a lot of you have been asking me, is this end times? Well, I'm going to try to answer those questions. Uh, as we do a little brief study of Revelation, uh, I'm also going to put out a uh, another blog, probably, that will be a teaching blog that will come about. I'll give you more information on that later. But what I want to give you this morning is a way to communicate with me. If you're watching on KWCL or if you're watching here on YouTube, uh, I have a way now you can communicate with me directly. It's uh, a Gmail site. It's an email site. Uh, it's called openuptheword2020 at gmail.com. Write that down. It's just what it says, openuptheword2020 at gmail.com. If you'll share any questions you may have as we begin this study, as we do our blogs, uh, as we do the uh, online on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock with Facebook. If you have any of those technologies, please join us. Uh, if you would like to receive a written copy of these sermons or a written copy of uh, the study that we'll be doing, send me an email, openuptheword2020, gmail at gmail.com. That is the, the email site where I can send it back to you. Uh, tell me you want to subscribe to that, and, and I'll get, keep you posted. We'll mail it out by snail mail. I can Gmail it back to you. Any way you want to receive it, I can get it to you. So just let me know. Open up the word 2020 at gmail.com. This morning, I want us to begin in the book of Revelation and to sort of give an overview of why in the world would I do a series. And as best I can tell, I've been working on this sermon series for long over a year. But in the last month or so, my series has had to change. Because I'm looking at it from, as my old professor used to say in seminary, preacher, if you're not preaching with a newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other, you're missing most of your congregation. So I don't want to miss the mark. So I'm sort of taking what's going on around us. And you've been watching my YouTube channel. You know I've been addressing some of that even in the sermons we've been doing up to this point. But from this day forward, we're going to look at a study of Revelation. Now that may turn some of you off. And if it does... I'm sorry, but I hope you'll stay with me because I want to give you maybe a new insight to Revelation. I don't want to look at it, at it as some uh, book that you're afraid to look at or something that would make you fear. I want it to be something that will help you uh, love and interpret the Bible and see what God is saying to us. And there's no better book to listen to the Word of God than Revelation because it is God speaking directly to us. We'll get into that a little more later. 
On November the 27th, 1989, the day when communism fell in Czechoslovakia, a Methodist church in the capital city of Prague erected a sign. I thought it was a cute sign. For decades, the church had been forbidden any publicity. But with the words of freedom blowing, the Christians posted three words which summarized not only the New Testament in general, but the book of Revelation in particular. The three words were, the Lamb wins. Uh, here in our church, we've sort of changed our motto lately because of this pandemic and all that's going on. Uh, our new motto is, God's got this. Well, the reason God's got this is because the Lamb won and the Lamb wins. Their point was not that Christ had unexpectedly gained a victory, but that he'd been reigning in triumph all along. Richard Brews, in his book, Christ Alone, says, Christ is always the winner. He was winning, even when the church seemed to lie crushed under the apparatus of totalitarian rule. Now at least it could be proclaimed. Proclaimed. Are we proclaiming God's word today? And that's sort of where I want to begin today as we look at Revelation. It's a place for us to begin the proclamation in the midst of the times we're in. I know a lot of people fear the book of Revelation. There's no other portion of scripture that is more misunderstood and mischaracterized than this book of the Bible. The fact is, the reason the book of Revelation is so poorly, poorly understood, it has been poorly interpreted and poorly taught. And I got news for you, I'm not the scholar of Revelation. What I'm going to give you is, I hope, an overview, a fly overview of Revelation and how it can be summarized in words. And the words are going to be, the Lamb wins. When I first started putting these series together a few years ago, I had no idea what we'd be facing here in July of 2020. What I do know is that the timing of this study can be prolific if we let it. The fact of the matter is, most people view the, view the book of Revelation as a book about the future. That's not necessarily true. It is a prophetic book. It is a book full of rich history and an incredible relevance for us today. More so, I think, maybe than ever before. Some people ask me if COVID-19 pandemic is an end times event. The short answer is yes. Jesus spoke of increases in earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in Luke 21, 11. Go read it. Or in Matthew 24, 7 that we talked about a few weeks ago. But we don't have to go far in Revelation to see how difficult things will be on the earth today and tomorrow. What people are really asking is, if I think that it's the final event or leading up to the final event that be the second coming of Christ, well, that answer is a little more difficult. We know that only God the Father knows when Christ will come again. And the short answer is, are we in that time? Well, we could be, but not necessarily. It's very important and timely for us as a church to study Revelation. Whatever the outcome of this pandemic, the church must always be ready to meet Jesus, whether it's in the pandemic or it's in everyday life. Today, I want us to look at the opening verses to show you why. Even if you're watching or listening and today you haven't taken time to seriously consider this part of the Bible, or perhaps you're skeptical even of the Christian faith, hang on, stay in tune. We're going to get to the bottom of how this affects us. Maybe we can universally agree that these 22 chapters at the end of the Bible carry enough significance for our study and preparedness for what could lie ahead. Why? Well, let's look at the opening words of Revelation. Let's begin with the first chapter of Revelation, the first few verses. It introduces itself as the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servant the things that must take place. And he put the word soon in it, must soon take place. You say, but preacher, that was written 2,000 years ago. Well, have you ever thought about what time is to God? Think about that. God's been around forever. So time is soon could mean many different things, and time means different things to different people. For some of us, we're so impatient that five minutes is a long period of time. For some of us, we sit for hours and think and meditate, <laughs> and for some people, Days go by before we even realize that the, what day of the week it is. I think the most important piece about Revelation is this book comes directly from God. Now, we hold, according to 1 Timothy, that all scriptures God breathes, so I understand that. But John opens this with a momentous declaration. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, this is from God, the Father himself. God the Father didn't give it just to anyone. He gave it to his son Jesus, he gave it to his angel, 
And then the angel revealed it to John, who we read in the Bible was probably the beloved disciple. This pedigree of those who were entrusted with this is not a consequence, and it's not a small consequence. It's not an accident. Let me give you an example. If you were in the military, you have a chain of command. If your sergeant came in and said, troops, we have a mission. We get our stuff together and we go do the job. And we say to the commander, we're ready. Or maybe the commander wasn't the one who came in and gave the order. Maybe it was a general, a four-star general came in and says, I have a mission for you today. This was handed directly to me from the top. The president, commander in chief. There's nothing we wouldn't do or sacrifice to see that the mission was accomplished, would we? So I think that's the way we need to look at Revelation. This is a revelation from our commander-in-chief called the Creator God. Also notice it's a revelation. I hear more people call it the book of Revelations. No, it's not multiple revelations. It's one. It is called Revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ to John the disciple to us today. It's a message and a mission coming straight from the top. John makes it clear that this is from God, not something fabricated by his vision, which is central to the very fabric of Christianity. Christianity was revealed by God to humans, not invented by humans to reveal to God. You see, we've tried to reverse that here lately. We've tried to tell God what to do. Matter of fact, the sign in front of my church today is sort of a funny. It says, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. We've been trying to tell God our plans and ask God to join with us. Henry Blackaby says, no, find out where God's at work and join God. Revelation is a direct word and shall be treated as such. So let's see what the word says. Revelation is a book from God to his servant. Revelation 1.1. The word there, servants, is literally a slave. It means one who is completely devoted and submitted to and under a specific authority. You see, the Christian is not a religious devotee or extremist. Christian is someone who has traded the bondage of being a slave to sin, being a slave to Christ Jesus, the one who frees them. Paul identifies himself as Christ's slave in Romans 1.1. 1, 1. He also uses the term slave to describe a believer. Listen, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of these things is death. Now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. It's Romans 6, 20-22. But God is telling us that there are these things that will soon take place. Revelation is not just a book about distant time in the future. Revelation is a book about now. It was about the now when John got it. It was about the now as the apostles told the story. It was about the now as the Bible was put together in the canon in 725. It's about the now in 2020, and it'll be about the now in 2025 if we're still around to, to be about that now. Someone asked me when the end times will come, and I can tell you with certainty the end times are coming. The end times are here now. But when will the end time be? I don't know. You don't know. Only God knows. For me and the studies I've done and read from many great scholars, I believe when Israel became a nation in 1947, the end time clock was restarted. Let me say that again so you don't misinterpret this. I believe when Israel became a nation in 1947, the end time clock restarted. I believe that we live in an era that has more end times prophecy fulfillment than ever before from 1947 a lot of us were born in that era. Uh, I was born in 1955, if you want to go figure out how old I am. I think we've been born into an era that very much calls us to talk about end times. I think what we're seeing around us right now, yes, are signs and wonders that lead us toward end times. Prophetic writings in the Bible nearly always have a present and a future context. So as we look at Revelation in a historical context, as Jesus arrest, uh, addressed the seven churches in Asia Minor, today we would call that Turkey, but also in a modern context to the church today. And it leads us into where we are going to study the next few weeks. Revelation is also a book to bless us. Listen to the words in the next few verses. 
He made it known by sending his angel to the servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in it, for the time is near. First three verses, Revelation. A book to us to tell us the time is near. But a preacher, I've already asked you, this was written 2,000 years ago. Well, here we go again. Revelation was not written to be something that was to put a clock to. You say, well, you just did, preacher. You said that 1947, the clock was restarted. Yeah, and I think it's been restarted many times. But I think we live in a time, and you must identify the era in which we live. We live in an era where the prophecy is unfolding. I tell my congregation quite often, there are less than two or three prophecies less to fulfill. And we'll get to those as we get deeper into Revelation. So hang on. Revelation also, John Wesley penned these words a few years ago when John Wesley was beginning the Methodist Church as we know it today. He said, Revelation was not written without tears and pain, and Revelation cannot be understood without a few tears and some pain. John Wesley put his readers and his studiers on notice that as we attempt to open the pages of Revelation, get ready. You must be fully prepared to let your intellect and your emotion be stimulated by these words as we read and hear them anew and afresh. You've heard the words as they're even written. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear. So whether you're reading it or whether you're listening to it, you've got a mission today. Are you willing to accept that mission? God has passed his revelation down through Jesus, into the apostle John, now to you and me as we open the book and read it. That would have been reason enough for the churches to dig into the words and each letter that it was written. But it's not just for anyone. You see, John was known as the disciple that loved Jesus. John got more than he bargained for. John himself even admits in the passages he doesn't understand all that's given to him in that vision. But I can assure you today that this message was given to the Apostle John for a specific reason. And you and I may be able to see we unpack this book, what that reason was. John was someone who was a disciple of Jesus from the very start of his ministry. John witnessed Jesus' baptism, his turning water into wine, his feeding of the 5,000. John was there on the Mount of Transfiguration and at the crucifixion. John was the first of the disciples to enter the vacated tomb. He walked with the risen Savior on the beach of Galilee, and he watched Jesus ascend into heaven. John is the blessed one, the chosen disciple, then John is a messenger of a blessing for us. Verse 3 makes it very clear that blessing is for us today as time moves on toward God's coming back in Jesus Christ as the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Nothing in the world's events should catch us by surprise. Even this crazy pandemic that we're in and these tumultuous political times God does not intend it to be that way because everything that happens is part of God's plan. And I have seen, as probably most of you have seen if you'll admit it, that God delights in revealing his plan to you and I so we can be a part of it. You're a part of that plan. Every Christian can and should be blessed in these days. Even in the persecutions and the trials, the weakness, the sin, or as John Wesley says, the tears and the pain. We are blessed as we are tried by God to see if we're faithful. Yet, when through faith we enter that glorious kingdom of Christ's resurrection power, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us, says Paul. So today, do you want to be a conqueror? Join with us as we open these words from God, receiving in Revelation the good news. The Lamb wins. We're blessed above all other blessings, to be able to be persuaded, if nothing else, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That was Paul's writing in Romans 8, 36. Nothing can separate us. Not a pandemic, not a political nightmare that we're going through. When we read this book, there are four ways that I think we have to delve into this study. And I want to highlight those four, sort of kick us off today. Historically, as a means to see God's work in the early church. That's the first piece I want us to see. We're going to look at this as a piece of history. 
and how God was working in the early church. We can also look at it as a coded message to the persecuted church during John's day, the letters to the seven churches. The churches were being persecuted. And I think if you listen to those letters, you'll find out that those letters apply even to us in our day as the church is being persecuted today. And if you're saying in the back of your mind, well, preacher, the church is not being persecuted. Yes, it is. The devil's been persecuting the church because he hates organized religion. He hates when people come together and gather and proclaim God's word. He hates what we're doing right now as we open this book and look for truth. The third thing, I think it, it's a revelation is a poetic and allegorical view of end times, both now and even into the future. And fourth, it's an apocalyptic prophecy of events to come. There's your mouthful. Apocalyptic, end times prophecy of events yet to come. I agree with scholars that say it's not an either or approach, but that we should view this divine writing using all four of these. What we will close with is the most significant characteristic of Revelation. It's a book about Jesus. If for nothing else, can we not open the book and see who Jesus is? Listen to the fourth verse and follow it. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before God's throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Wow, what a greeting. But he didn't stop there. Listen to the seventh verse. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. <clears throat> Powerful four, ver eight, four verses, verses four through eight. They form a sort of a doxology that comprise a typical opening of an epistle of the day. He's writing to the seven churches in Asia, or as we said a while ago, probably what we know as Turkey today. And we'll get there in a few weeks. We'll see the seven churches as a greeting of the Trinity, who is, who was, and who is to come. And the seven spirits who are before his throne as an image of the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of earth. We know that believe in Jesus Christ, that all authority has been given to him, so that salvation transi transitions us to a new life. And give Jesus Christ authority over our life and what we do with our life. Here's five ways that I think that can be stated. Jesus is the one who frees mankind from sin throughout through his own blood. Number two, Jesus established us in his Father's kingdom in heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father now as he intercedes for us. Thirdly, he's coming soon. Fourth, everyone will see him on the day he returns. Fifth, every person who rejected him, no matter their beliefs or ethnicity, will mourn. If you reject Jesus Christ, there will be a great day of mourning. But if you accept Christ, there will be a day like no other day. It's a hard to many in the world to think that Christ is coming again. People do not wish to be judged or condemned in this whole world today. We want everything to be free. Well, I got news for you. Freedom even requires some judgment and condemnation. Those who stand on their own righteousness will be condemned. But it didn't have to be that way. And so as we begin this study of Revelation, as we look at chapters 1 through 3, as the church is addressed, a letter from Jesus. <coughs> John's going to give us what we need. More than anything else, it's a warning and a call to repentance. I believe that more than anything else, Jesus wants his church to be ready for him. He wants the bride, as he's referred to, the church is called his bride, adorned. He wants him, the, the bride adorned and prepared for his coming. 
and his coming will be soon. The question is, are we ready? Therefore, I want to do this study to help us prepare. Are we living as we belong to the kingdom of God? Are we ready to stand before him on that day, that judgment day? Does our life reflect that we are on a mission and following orders from the top? Or are we following orders from the sideline, the devil? Do we live like Jesus is Lord of our life? Is he the Lord of everything in our life, our finances, our internet usage, our family, our everything? More than anything we see that Jesus wants us to do is to be prepared for his coming. For those who aren't watching and waiting, he'll come as a surprise, a thief in the night. For those of us who are expecting it, we're looking out the door every day. Lord, are you coming today? And so this book will disturb some of you, it will encourage some of you, and for some of you, you will choose to ignore it. That's okay. The Bible says it's going to be that way. If there were any other way to wash us from our sins, God would have done it. I want you to hear that. But he didn't do it but one way. He sent Jesus Christ, shed his own blood to be the ultimate sacrifice of God the Son. God wouldn't do it this way unless it was the only way. In light of all that Jesus did for us, we have a right to praise him, to seek him, to study his word. And that's what we're going to do in the next few weeks. We should honor him with our glory and, our, and, his, and let him be dominion over our life. We say this, we aren't giving Jesus just glory and dominion. We're simply recognizing that he deserves it and that we're honoring him for what he's done for us. I'll conclude where I started. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, which means that Jesus is before all things, now in all things, and will remain beyond this day to care for all things. He's the A to Z and everything in between. Jesus has a plan for history, for the time ahead, for the time now, and he's calling us to be a part of directing the path of human events toward the fulfillment of God's ultimate plan. I question to you today, will you become Jesus' servant? If Jesus is the author of history, will you give your life to him? I ask you to join me in the next few weeks as we move into the letter God writes to the churches. I think it's time we open our mail. If you've been afraid to open the envelope called Revelation, Today is the time to do it. Remember my email site if you want to send me questions, comments. Open up the word 2020. Open up the word 2020 at gmail.com. Let me hear from you. Hope you have a great week. I'll be getting out some uh, more information about our YouTube and uh, Facebook sites. Facebook on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock will be Facebook Live for prayer time, and you can send me comments live while I'm online, and we can have prayer and look again into what God is leading us and what we need to be praying for in these days. If you have special prayer requests, send those to me. Look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for joining us today. See you again later.